listening into this conversation, and he sat there just very quietly while I was going backwards and forwards with Solars. And when it was all over, walking back to the UN from the residence, after Solars had just gone, I said to him, well, what did you think about that? You know, obviously, I thought it was a pretty good idea. And he said, Minister, I have to say, due respect, that this is the greatest load of poppycock I have ever heard from anyone, and it's absolutely nonsensical that you should even think of taking it seriously. Well, luckily, I didn't take his advice. I wasn't all that fantastically good at taking the advice of senior bureaucrats in those days if I thought it was wrong-headed or if I thought it was too dull and too conservative and too cautious, and I thought this response was all of those things. So I got excited about it and set a process in train. I can't pretend that the idea of the UN itself came from me. It didn't. It came from CNUC originally, via Solars, it had been around for a while. But what was new was the detail with which we developed this concept, thought it through, planned it through. And what was also new was the political and diplomatic effort that we put into pursuing it. We didn't just put it out in a speech and wait for something to happen. We went after it, and I'll describe how. In advocating a very <coughs> substantially enhanced UN role in the settlement, we knew that we were being very ambitious. The UN was certainly uh, well enough experienced in peacekeeping operations, as I've already said, and in monitoring elections. But up to that time, it had not had a role in the civil administration of any of its member states, nor had it even had primary responsibility for organising and conducting elections as distinct from monitoring them. Moreover, of course, conditions within Cambodia, including the very fragile character of any potential ceasefire, the difficulty of monitoring guerrilla forces, the lack of developed uh, transport and communications infrastructure, meant that the overall UN operation would be very much more difficult than that which had been experienced in most other situations that the UN had previously got involved in. Moreover, there could be no absolute guarantee that even if it purported to accept a peace plan, the Khmer Rouge would simply not resume fighting after the transitional period. And indeed, as we now know, the Khmer Rouge did in fact walk away from the agreement, making the period leading up to the, what became the 1993 election was incredibly tense. But there were two crucial new factors that we thought would minimise this risk. Firstly, China, as part of the proposed deal, would give an international legally binding undertaking to cease arms supply to the Khmer Rouge, <coughs> which would be then under international scrutiny, close international scrutiny, to uphold that undertaking, Chinese that is, and could be reasonably expected to honour it. The second consideration was that we thought that in these new arrangements, this new context, the Cambodian administration, the Cambodian parts of the new administration, would be accepted by the international community as the, the government of the country and would, in a way that had not previously been the case um, in any proposed transitional arrangement, and that it would be likely to receive a result of economic, social and technical assistance uh, during the whole uh, process, including the reconstruction process. And we thought that taken together, these factors would mean that the newly elected Cambodian government, so I'm talking about the situation that would exist after the process and the newly Cambodian government in place, we thought this would be in a much better position uh, than any of its predecessors to withstand any renewed challenge from the Khmer Rouge. The initial response to my statement in the Senate outlining this concept in November 89 was really nothing less than remarkable, I'm thinking back on it. It very quickly became clear that the, the idea, which was spelled out in the way I've just done, was an idea whose time had come. And within a matter of weeks, most of the participants who I listed previously, the participants in the Paris conference, had given it varying degrees of public as well as just private endorsement. That process, and I've described this on many previous occasions, but again, I think it's important to put it on the record, the process was, was really remarkably assisted by an extraordinary 
feat of diplomatic endurance by Michael Costello, who was then the Deputy Secretary of the Foreign Affairs Department. I'd tasked him, uh, straight after the speech that I gave, I tasked him in early December to pay a quick visit to Hanoi. It was in between talks that he was having already in Hawaii on something else and talks he was about to have in Tokyo. I said, divert to Hanoi and check this out, test it out thoroughly with the Vietnamese to see if it will fly. And that initial detour, it did fly with the Vietnamese. They called me up and said, what next? I said, well, try now, let's try now Beijing and see what they think about it. And one step after another uh, took place so that what was intended to be a, about a week away for Costello turned out to be a series of meetings in 13 countries over a period of 21 days involving some 30 major meetings with the key players at prime ministerial, foreign ministerial, presidential level, um, in which the plan was talked through with each of them and steadily refined as went along with backwards and forwards exchanges every night by cable or telephone by me with, uh, with Costello. And during the course of this odyssey, the Australian sort of idea did become a fully fledged Australian initiative or plan as we constantly defined and developed the detailed elements and responded to suggestions, responded to criticisms from these various interlocutors. Particularly encouraging was the response of the United States administration. It had already initiated in late 89 with the Soviet Union a proposal to join the other three members of the Security Council in a series of consultations on Cambodia. So they had set the train running uh, themselves to, to do at least this. And the whole Permanent Five met as a group in Paris, that's the US, UK, France, Russia and China. They met in mid-January uh, 1990 and agreed by consensus on a set of 16 principles which would form the basis for their own future discussions. And those principles included, and I don't think this was entirely coincidental, strong endorsement of the concept of an enhanced United Nations role in the transitional period, which had not previously been part of their thinking. This was a new ingredient, and it came up in this really quite formal context. So with this meeting, we had, in fact, the beginnings of what was, for the next two or three years, a two-track process, two-track international process involving the Permanent Five at one level and the Paris Conference process still co-chaired by France and Indonesia at the other level. And between the two levels, it was quite complex, but a quite productive interaction was maintained. By January, by late January 1990, Indonesian uh, Foreign Minister, my good friend Ali Alatas, who was co-chairman of the Paris Conference, had himself been exploring the possibility of a, another informal regional meeting on Cambodia, felt sufficiently encouraged by what we were telling him about our own consultations around the entire region and the world, and by what was happening with the P5, he felt sufficiently encouraged to convene a meeting in Jakarta in late February 1990, involving um, the four Cambodian parties, Vietnam, Laos and the ASEAN countries. It was a regional meeting, but in recognition of the contribution that we were making uh, to the process, Australia was invited to attend as a resource a delegation. And it was in preparation for this meeting that the famous Red Book, I meant to bring a copy of it with me to wave around, but this is where the Red Book, which everybody still seems to remember in Cambodia, a rather bigger Red Book than Chairman Mao's Red Book, but the Red Book nonetheless, um, came into, into being. Because in preparation for this meeting that we were asked to attend as a resource delegation, what I did was set in train a whole burst of activity in which an Australian technical mission went to Cambodia, Bangkok, and to the Thai-Cambodian border area in the first half of February 1990 to gather further information on administrative structures and all the other data that was necessary to develop a full United Nations role. And at the Jakarta meeting, which was just 10 days later, we produced a 155-page um, series of working papers involving that technical mission's findings and covering uh, in some detail all the necessary elements of a comprehensive 
settlement. We were pretty busy in Canberra that month, and those papers were subsequently published with this red binding around them, which became known as the Red Book, Cambodia and Australian Peace Proposal. These papers in this book outlined in detail the role that we proposed for the UN in the civil administration of the country in organising and conducting elections and maintaining a secure environment in which an electoral choice could be freely exercised. And we also explored in a great deal of detail, which people thought was a pretty adventurous thing to do, a range of uh, costings of what it, would all, what it would all take to put together. Conventional wisdom at the time had it that any such exercise would be totally beyond the resources of the UN, but we did some very detailed calculations and we estimated that the whole thing, uh, transitional administration, the cost of the military involvement and bedding everything down before the internationals could walk away, would take 18 months and would cost 1.3 billion US dollars, billion US dollars. And we thought that it was doable affordable, practicable within that time frame. It's interesting to note, <coughs> when all this was washed up, that when the actual cost of what's become known as the UNTAC, Transitional Assistance a Mission in Cambodia operation, was eventually put into place for the two-year period from November 91 through to November 93, the actual cost of that two-year operation was 1.7 billion US dollars, which was remarkably close to our original guesstimate although by then a number of the details of the plan had changed. So that was the preparation that was done for this February 1990 Jakarta meeting. And that meeting came incredibly tantalisingly close to reaching agreement on statement of principles, doing all the things we wanted done, including an enhanced role in all these respects for the UN. But in the event, it just failed to produce the necessary agreement. Consensus broke down on one particular question, whether the agreed record should make specific reference to, quote, the prevention of the recurrence of genocidal policies and practices. While the outcome was uh, very disappointing, I mean, the, the Vietnamese wanted that in there, the others didn't, and that's where the thing broke down. While the outcome was uh, disappointing, to put it very mildly, that meeting did begin a process of consensus building which did eventually bear fruit in the Paris Peace Conference, producing a final agreement the following year. I won't go through all of the steps along the way because it does get incredibly tortuously complicated and at this stage it's probably fair to say that Australia was pushed back uh, out of the middle of the picture by the P5, the US in particular, that said, well, you know, we're now running this. Uh, don't trouble your pretty little head. Yes, you've done some helpful work, but now it's <laughs> us. A very familiar, uh, very familiar story for those who've ever dealt with these guys. Um, and it's very, very interesting to read some of the accounts that are written in later years about who did what in terms of the Cambodia peace process. And... Um, I think we get one footnote in the book by Dick Solomon, the, uh, the US guy who uh, ran the process there. In others, we get much more recognition. But that's, that's life, and you move on. The, um, we did play, because we had such a close working relationship with Indonesia and with Alitas, we did play a role hovering around, and in particular in the preparation of the rather important draft negotiating text. Uh, which we developed uh, with the Indonesians and which did, did eventually become the centrepiece of the final negotiations. But we weren't really at the table. What did happen during the course of 1990 was that finally the UN itself, um, with this push from the big guys, did in the Secur Security Council, excuse me, and in General Assembly, in resolutions in those bodies in September and October, 1990 did endorse the basic elements of the peace plan and certainly with, at the beginning of 1991 it seemed likely to be really quick and painless run home to the implementation of it all. But despite all the momentum um, that had been built up and all the effort that had been put into it, um, it was then that things ground to a halt uh, yet again uh, and 
process looked in danger of stalling completely, 